Hey fourth graders, Mr. B. We're going to be spending another Friday with Grandma Dowdell. And it's another story from Richard Peck's A Long Way from Chicago. <clears throat> this one's called Things with Wings, set in 1934. This is another one told by Joey about him and his sister Mary Alice visiting their Grandma Dowdell. <clears throat> When we got off the train, Grandma was there on the platform. After our first visit, she'd never met us on the uh, she'd never met us at the train, figuring we could find our own way. But she, here she was, under her webby old black umbrella to shade her from the sun. <clears throat> but she wasn't there to meet us. She was seeing somebody off. A lady was climbing up into the car behind ours. We caught only a squint in the dazzling light, but knew the hat. It was Mrs. Effie Wilcox. With a powerful arm, Grandma swung Mrs. Wilcox's bulging valise aboard, then a picnic hamper. She stepped back as the bluebird pulled out. She didn't wave, but scanned the windows to see if Mrs. Wilcox found a seat. Then, Grandma turned to us. <clears throat> You could never call her a welcoming woman, but uh, today her mind was truly miles away. I was falling behind with our suitcase, though this year I was nearly as tall as Grandma herself. Was Mrs. Wilcox going on a trip? Mary Alice inquired. <clears throat> She's gone for good, Grandma said, off to double up with her sister in Palmyra. Banks foreclosing on her house, so she lit out not wanting to watch them dump her stuff in the road. After Wilcox died, she left the farm and bought that house in town, but she can't keep up with the payments. <clears throat> At noon dinner that day, Mary Alice and I distracted Grandma with all the excitement we'd left behind in Chicago. In July, they'd killed John Dillinger, public enemy number one. He'd been on a long spree robbing banks throughout the Middle West. The public didn't know whether they wanted him caught or not. He'd provided a lot of entertainment in hard times. Since he stole from banks, he was called a Robin Hood, though he wasn't known for giving to the poor. <clears throat> He'd gone to a picture show at the Biograph Theater not far from our neighborhood. With him were two bad women, and one of them tipped off the cops, who filled him full of lead right there on the sidewalk. Then, to prove they'd finally nailed D John Dillinger, the police put his body on display in the morgue basement. <clears throat> People trooped past for a look. Women dipped their handkerchiefs in his bloody wounds for souvenirs. But he was so bloated and shot up that some people said it wasn't Dillinger at all. Rumor had it he was holed up somewhere. Mary Alice and I had sulked because neither mother nor dad would take us to view the riddled corpse. Recalling to ourselves Shotgun Cheatham, we thought we could take it. When we got back to school in September, everybody would say they'd seen the cadaver. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity lost. <clears throat> I'd have took you, Grandma said. We didn't doubt it. Grandma wouldn't have minded to look for herself at all that remained of John Dillinger. Mary Alice and I went upstairs to sort out our clothes from the single suitcase. She was getting particular about how everything she wore had to be hung up on a hanger just so. Grandma's missing Mrs. Wilcox, she mentioned. Are you kidding? I said. She's Grandma's worst enemy. <clears throat> She says Mrs. Wilcox's tongue is attached in the middle and flaps at both ends. This town will be quieter without her, and Grandma will like that. You don't know anything, Mary Alice said. Men don't have any idea about women. <clears throat> so I loped uptown by myself, heading for Veach's Gas and Oil, which was man's country. Ray Veach ran the garage when his dad was farming, and I thought I had some business with him. <clears throat> the town was half asleep with August and the Depression. A checker game was going on in the coffee pot cafe as I went past, but nothing else. 
A knot of people outside Moore's store waited for the day-old bread to go half price. In the window of Stubbs and Askew, the insurance agency, you could, you could put up handbills. The biggest was a drawing of the giant farm implement shed that Deere and Company was proposing to put up on the block where the old brickyard had been. Next to it, a handbill advertised a rummage sale at the United Brethren Church. Bring and buy. Treasures, trash, bric-a-brac. Down-to-earth prices. Lunch provided by Our Lady's Circle. The last handbill was a schedule of the movies the Lions Club was showing at their outdoor picture show. They weren't new movies. Some of them weren't even talkies. It looked like a slow week. Now a talkie is a film with sound. Uh, before the talkies we had silent movies. And of course at this point in time any movie that, the, that um, Joey would go and see would not be in color. <clears throat> because most of the movies were in black and white. Okay, one of the early color films was The Wizard of Oz, and um, and it was just it just blew people away because it was in color. I crossed the Wabash tracks, past the grain elevator, on my way to Veach's garage, eating the dust of the trucks hauling in the beans. Veach's garage had been the blacksmith shop, and they still kept the anvil inside. Now. It was a one-pump filling station with an outdoor lift. I blundered along toward it. Then the dust cleared, and I saw her. It was love at first sight, like I'd been waiting for her all my life. She stood on the pavement in front of Veach's, shimmering in her loveliness, and so, great, and so graceful she might glide past me as if I wasn't there, leaving me in the dust. She was a showroom fresh Terraplane 8 from the Hudson Motor Car Company. A four-door sedan, tan, with red stripping and another touch of red at the hubcaps. Tears sprang and my eyes stung. I couldn't help it. My hands curled like I had her steering wheel in my grip. No car company had an agency in Grandma's town, not even Ford, but Veaches would order you a car. Raid said nobody had bought one in two years. He ducked out from under an ancient locomobile up on the lift, working a greasy rag over his big hands. <clears throat> Ray was 17 and man-sized, and I'd worked hard to know him because I wanted him to teach me how to drive. He'd given me a couple of lessons last summer, but he wanted two dollars for the full course. People around here didn't overreact even when they hadn't seen you for a year. Ray jerked a thumb back at the locomobile he'd been working under. Through a rod. I nodded like I knew. But I couldn't take my eyes off the terraplane. Somebody order it? Ray rubbed his stubbled chin with the back of his hand in a way I admired. Who's got $795? This baby's top of the line. Son, it's got a radio. I wanted to ask him if he'd driven it, but that was too close to asking him for a ride and a lesson. We both knew I didn't have two dollars. Hudson's sending out their new terraplane models to drum up interest. It's the make Dillinger drove to outrun the cops, but hey, you know that, Ray said. You probably took a gander at the body the Chicago cops put on display. You reckon it really was, Dillinger? I shrugged. I could see this was the summer when I missed out on everything. That night after supper, Grandma said, I suppose you kids want to go to the picture show, meaning she wanted to go to the picture show. We were willing, though going to the pictures for us was the Oriental Theater in Chicago, featuring a first-run movie, a pipe organ, and a stage show with a dog act. It was different at Grandma's. On Wednesday nights, the Lions Club sponsored the picture show in the park, 
They put up canvas walls so it was like a tent without a roof. You sat on benches, and they showed the movie on a sheet hung from the branch of a tree. Everybody but Baptist came. Hey, well, why wouldn't my, my family go? Or do they mean Baptists like the people who go to the Baptist church? Hmm. Admission was a nickel ahead or a can of food for the hungry. Grandma took a quart mason jar of her beets, and we three got in on that. Since nobody liked sitting behind Grandma, we settled on the back row. There was some socializing she didn't take part in. Then the projectionist got the film threaded, and the show started. Mary Alice had been hoping for a Shirley Temple, but it was, it was a Dracula, not too old, starring Bella Lugosi. Bella Lugosi, the Dracula. Oh yeah, I said it. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah, you watch it. Mm -hmm. You'll see. I have to say, it got to me. All those living dead people with black lips. When Dracula turned into a bat at the window, the night behind him merged with the night around us. It was a good audience for a horror picture. Several people screamed, and once a whole bench turned over. A night breeze sighed in the tree, making the screen waver. Mary Alice kept her eyes shut through most of it. Grandma barely blinked. Afterward, we walked home in the dark. Mary Alice stuck close to Grandma, and I wasn't far off myself. The town was just one shadow after another. When a big lilac bush through leaf patterns on the walk ahead of us, Grandma shied like a horse. Then we came to an old oak tree growing close to the road. Grandma pulled back and edged around it like Count Dracula was standing on the other side, in a cape. Two or three years earlier, we'd have thought the movie had spooked Grandma. Now, we wondered if she was trying to spook us. When we were safely inside at home, she made a business of latching the screen door. Then she looked meaningfully at the window over by the sink, like Dracula's electric eyes might be staring in out of his terrible fanged face. Mary Alice and I were frozen to the linoleum in spite of ourselves. Grandma, there aren't really such things as vampires, are they? Mary Alice asked. Did she want to know, or was she testing Grandma? Every summer, Mary Alice seemed to pick up another of Grandma's traits. Vampires? No, the only real bloodsuckers is the banks. Grandma stroked her chins. Movies is all pretend. They're made in California, you know. But they prove a point, make something seem real, and people will believe it. The public will swallow anything. That seemed her last word of the, for the night. Now Mary Alice and I had to stumble up that long staircase to the darkness above. Being the man of the family, I ought to have gone first. But I didn't. Well, sweet dreams, Grandma said behind us. It was a long night and hot. Mary Alice shut her window to keep vampire bats out. I know because I heard her closing hers whilst I was closing mine. The next morning, after that restless night, I said to Grandma at the breakfast table, I need two bucks bad. Who done it? Grandma said. What for? Driving lessons. And Ray Veach wants two dollars to teach me. What do you want to learn to drive for anyway? she said. Don't you go around Chicago in taxi cabs and trolleys? I couldn't explain it to Grandma. I was getting too old to be a boy, and driving meant you were a man. Something like that. I shrugged, and she slid a belly-busting breakfast in front of me. Mary Alice turned up, looking like the ghost of herself. She was pale-faced with bags under her eyes. Though glad to see daylight, she was worn to a frazzle. 
Anyhow, Grandma said, you don't have time for driving lessons. I want you two to poke around in the attic. I can't get up there anymore. You have to climb up through a trap door in the closet. Well, what are you looking for? Oh, I don't know. Any old rummage for the church sale. So, Grandma, who didn't take part in community activities, wanted to go to the rummage sale. She ate with the fork in one hand, the knife in the other. Then she looked up like she was having one of her sudden thoughts. Tell you what, find that old stovepipe stove hat up there. It belonged to a preacher who knew my ma and pa. He was visiting one time, trying to convert them. And he dropped dead on the parlor rug. They kept his stovepipe hat on their hat rack ever since and to remember him by. I stuck it up there. Get it down. I saw a picture in the paper of John D. Rockefeller in a hat like that. They may be coming back in style. I doubted that last part. But Mary Alice and I dragged a ladder upstairs. Grandma followed as far as the second floor to show us where the trap door was. We were disappearing up into the attic when below us she said, Watch yourselves. I might have bats in my belfry. We weren't familiar with attics, but this one wasn't too crowded. Grandma used up more than she saved. There were some three-legged chairs and a dress dummy half her size and some coal oil lamps from olden times. Mary Alice dodged cobwebs and tried not to brush against anything. I hate it up here, she said. But then she started going through a couple of old steamer trunks. I pulled a big furry buffalo robe out of mine. What about this? Mary Alice shrank. Don't touch it. It's awful. It's got living things in it. She was right. Things with wings. I put it aside. Then I came to some baby clothes. Maybe dad's. Nothing too likely even for a rummage sale. Mary Alice's trunk was full of paper, yellowed, farm journals and buttons on cardboard and a ton of dress patterns. Then she gasped. In her hand was an ancient valentine, a big heart surrounded by paper lace. The motto on it read, When Cupid sends his arrow home, I hope it misses you. Like Mr. and Mrs. Misses you. It was signed with a question mark. But Joey, who was it sent to? Mary Alice wondered. Grandma, I guess. She got valentines? Mary Alice and I stared at each other. Then she found another one, also ancient, but without the lace. When you're old and think you're sweet, take off your shoes and smell your feet. That sounds more like it, Mary Alice said. A voice of doom echoed up from the trap door. You find that stovepipe hat yet? <clears throat> I jumped. And so did Mary Alice. The lid on her trunk dropped down on, the, on her head. Grandma was standing right under the trap door, listening to us and waiting for the stovepipe hat. I really, really hate this attic, Mary Alice said, whispering. The hat was in my trunk. I handed it down to Grandma. It's getting too uh, excuse me. It's getting too hot up here, Mary Alice said, and all those dress patterns are from before the war. But out of the bottom of her trunk, she pulled up an old quilt. It was so worn you could just about see through it. Its pattern was fancy, but faded. How about this? she said to me. She was looking around the hem to see if it were, if the quilt maker had stitched in her initials but the edges were all fraying away. What is it? said the trap door. An old quilt, we both yelled down. Oh, I forgot about that, Grandma hollered back. My Aunt Josie Small pieced that quilt. Drop it down. I did, and Grandma said, Keep at it. We listened to her trudge away. 
Other trunks were tucked away under the eaves, so it took us all morning to go through everything. But we didn't find anything else any sane person would want in a thousand years. That afternoon, we walked uptown and a block beyond to the United Brethren Church. We weren't going for the lunch the ladies' circle was selling. We ate at home, but Grandma said they'd be offering free lemonade. She'd taken off her apron and wore a hat. Not her fine, fair-going hat. This was the one she gardened and fished in, nibbled at the brim. She'd stuck a fresh peony at the front of the crown to dress it up. She strolled along over the occasional sidewalks with the preacher's stovepipe hat in a grocery bag. Mary Alice wore her straw hat and a dress because we were going to church, more or less. I brought up the rear with Aunt Josie Small's quilt folded over my sweating arm. What's a church rummage sale like anyway? Mary Alice asked. Ever been in a hen house? Grandma said. The sale was in the church basement. The air was battered by funeral parlor fans, and ladies were picking over long tables. Some were still bringing in their treasures and trash. Others were snatching things up and taking them to the cashier's and a cashier's card table to pay for them. A sharp scent of potato salad hung in the air, but the ladies' circle had cleared away lunch. Now they were bringing out pitchers of free lemonade. Everybody looked up when Grandma loomed into the room, as people always did. Several pulled back, but a tall, strict-looking lady came forth. My goodness, it's Mrs. Dowdell, she said. <clears throat> Grandma made short work of her by handing over the grocery bag and nodding at the quilt, which I offered up. Mary Alice went for a look at the merchandise, but the tables were surrounded by flying elbows so I settled next to Grandma. She was on a folding chair, pouring herself a glass of lemonade. She had a way of sitting with her feet apart and her hands on her knees. After a good long swig of lemonade, she observed the scene. In fact, she was biding her time. Somehow, I knew this. A flurry began at the other end of a table. From their hats, they were all town ladies, not country. A hiss of whispers whipped up into raised voices. Grandma sat on at her ease. Then, the strict lady in charge, who was Mrs. Earl T. Askew, came through the crowds, heading for us. Mrs. Askew's face had gone vampire white. Bending to Grandma, she spoke in low, urgent tones. Mrs. Dowdell! I feel I must tell you that Mrs. L.J. Weidenbach, the banker's wife, has offered $15 for that stovepipe hat. She stared at Grandma for a reaction and got nothing back. Mrs. Dowdell, are you 100% sure you want to part with that hat? It don't belong to me, Grandma made a small gesture. I have an idea it was in with some other old stuff Effie Wilcox threw away when the bank ran her out of town. Mrs. Askew's gaze was electric. Other old stuff? She seemed to have trouble breathing. Grandma nodded. Uh, just old clutter Effie had found in the house back when she moved in. Mrs. Askew pivoted like a dancer and was gone. Already, Mrs. L.J. Weidenbach was over at the cashier, peeling off $5 bills as fast as she could dig them out of her pocketbook. Oh, Grandma, I thought, what have you done? Mrs. Askew plunged back. Aunt Josie Small's quilt was clutched in her arms like a long-lost child. Mrs. Dowdell, she said, Oh, Mrs. Dowdell, are you 100%... Grandma took the quilt onto her lap, smoothed it out, and looked it over. A crowd gathered. There, in the corner, worked in faded thread, initials had magically appeared on the fraying hem. M-T-L. Suddenly, Mrs. Weidenbach appeared, gripping the preacher's stovepipe hat. You know what a stovepipe hat looks like, don't you?
kind of like this, but straighter on the sides. She went right for Mrs. Askew. What have you got there? Let me... Not so fast, Wilhelmina, Mrs. Askew snapped. I seen... I saw it first. She swept up the quilt that Grandma gladly surrendered. Oh, what are those initials? Mrs. Weidenbach was beside herself. Oh, my stars and garters! MTL! Mary Todd Lincoln! And I've got Abe Lincoln's own stovepipe hat! His name's lettered in on the, on the sweatband. Better check mine. Nope. Just a cool hat. Two things happened that next morning. A car from out of town backfired in the vicinity of the bank and everybody on the sidewalk dropped down and grabbed gravel. Who knew but what John Dillinger was alive and well and up to his old tricks. The other thing was a knock at Grandma's front door right after breakfast. Mary Alice and I followed when she went to answer it. Opening to a stringy young guy in a seersucker, in a seersucker suit. Well, Otis, she said. What? Ma'am, he said, Mr. Weidenbach would be pleased if you could spare him a moment of your time at your earliest convenience. Grandma stepped back and clutched her throat, showing shock. <laughs> Don't tell me the bank's failed. Banks is failing all over. Had I better draw out my funds? Is there time? Uh, no, ma'am. The bank's still in business. Otis looked down at his boots. Your $17 is safe. You give me a turn, she said, slapping at her bosom and shutting the door in his face. She waited an hour and a half. Then she put on her gardening hat and went uptown to the bank. Mary Alice and I went with her. When we got to the business block, people were still just getting up off the sidewalk. The bank was store-sized and the only teller was Otis, back in his cage. He waved us through to the rear office beside the safe. I'd never seen Mr. Weidenbach before, but this couldn't have been one of his better days. Over his head on the wall above the desk was a wide-mouthed bass, stuffed. You'll have to excuse me, he boomed, showing us chairs. Uh, this crack-brained rumor that Dillinger is still alive is doing our business no good. If it's a rumor at all, said Grandma, on her dignity and then some, a rumor is sometimes truth on the trail. I am interested to hear you say so, Mrs. Dowdell, the banker pulled the purse strings of his mouth taut. It brings us to the point. Get right to it, Grandma said. Uh, certain items, uh, supposedly from the estate of President and Mrs. Abraham Lincoln, have surfaced in a house the bank is forced to foreclose on. Do you grasp what this could mean, Mrs. Dowdell? Grandma thought she did. I expect the state will take that land and restore the house as a museum. I hear a rumor Lincoln debated Douglas in that very parlor. Rumor has it he split the rails for the fence that used to enclose the brickyard. And who's been circulating such cockeyed rumors? The banker turned a deeper color. Who knows where a rumor starts, Grandma said. Who knows where it'll end? They've very likely heard it at the State House in Springfield by now. I have an idea they'll send over a historian any day now to snoop. Mrs. Dowdell, the bank has signed papers with Deer and Company to build an implement shed across that entire property and the site of the old brickyard, too. Any delay throws a monkey wrench in the deal. Better times are on the way, and what's good for a bank is good for the community. But a nice state park wouldn't be bad either, Grandma pondered. We could all set out on summer evenings, recalling Honest Abe. That park we got now is just wasteland the Wabash Railroad didn't want. Mr. Weidenbach's gaping mouth hung near his blotter now. 
He had his desktop in a death grip. Mrs. Dowdell, you falsified those so-called Lincoln items. They're bogus. I could have the law on you. That's right. Grandma gazed above him at the wide-mouthed bass. The banker throws the poor old widder in the pokey. That'll look real good for your business. Mr. Biden, Weidenbach was smaller now, deflated. Mrs. Dowdell, he said, in a voice strangled with emotion, help me out of this. I'm in too deep with John Deere. I got to go forward because I can't do otherwise. Lop off your back end, Grandma said. I beg your pardon? Build a shorter implement shed over the old brickyard and leave Effie Wilcox's house be. A glimmer of hope showed in the banker's hard eye. I suppose we could go back to the drawing board and reallocate our square footage. Do that, Grandma said. And one more thing. You give Effie Wilcox back her house, free and clear. It ain't worth nothing anyway, apart from its historical value. Mrs. Dowdell, that's not business, the banker said. That's blackmail. What's the difference, Grandma said. A silence was observed. Then Banker Weidenbach turned up his hands. All right. It's Mrs. Wilcox's house, free and clear. But you'll have to confess you falsified those so-called Lincoln items. Fair's fair. Oh, well, Grandma sketched a casual pattern in the air with one hand. Oh, we can get that rumor going right now. Effie didn't mean to put Lincoln's name in the stovepipe hat. I mean, she just lettered in a Lincoln to mean it was the kind of hat he wore. Mary Alice and I exchanged a look across Grandma. And that MTL on the quilt? <laughs> Shaw, sure, Grandma said. Effie Wilcox had a cousin name of Maud Teeter Lingenbloom. That's MTL for you. Mr. Weidenbach replied in an exhausted voice. I'll get the word out. Grandma was on her feet now. She patted the bun of her back. Uh, she patted the bun of her back hair under the nibbled brim. Free and clear. You got that? She said to Mr. Weidenbach. Effie don't make no more payments on that house. Then, as if a sudden thought struck her, she nudged me. And you can give this boy here a, a two dollar bill. She nudged Mary Alice. And fair is fair. And give this girl two dollars too. That's big money for young un, the banker said. Shall I draw it out of your account, Mrs. Dowdell? No, you double-dealing, four-flushing old cootie, she replied. You can draw it out of your own wallet. Any man with a wife will pay $15 for an old preacher's moth-eaten stovepipe hat has four bucks to spare. Silent wars seemed to wage in Mr. Weidenbach's brain. And then he pulled his wallet out of his hip pocket. He kept a bootlace tied around it. We watched as he drew out a pair of two-dollar bills and handed them to Mary Alice and me. And heaven help us, we took them. Rumors are things with wings, too. The rumor that I had two dollars reached Ray Veach before I could. He was going to have to give me my driving lessons at the end of the day when he was sure his dad was out on the farm milking. Otherwise, his dad would take a cut. Also, we needed to use the Terraplane 8, which was strictly forbidden under an agreement with the Hudson Motor Car Company. I started off to raise that evening with a $2 bill in my jeans and a song in my heart. I felt like I was six feet tall and shaved. My right hand played through the gear shift positions, and I was ready. Then Grandma called out after me that she and Mary Alice were going along for the ride. And how could I explain to Grandma that learning to drive was kind of a sacred thing and you didn't want your kid sister and your grandma along? Grandma filled most of the back seat of the terraplane. Mary Alice sat beside her with an unspent two-dollar bill in her pocketbook. 
from Grandma, Mary Alice, was learning thrift. She could squeeze two cents till they begged for mercy, let alone two dollars. Ray was up in front with me, and I was behind the wheel. I'd crept out of town in second gear, and now Ray was showing me third. I knew if I got so much as a scratch on the fender, I was a dead man, so that kept me alert, and I stayed to the crown of the road, hoping not to meet anyone on coming. Visors slipped down to keep the setting sun out of our eyes. It was a car with every refinement. And though I wasn't steering straight yet, I was beginning to get the feel of the thing. The terraplane and I were becoming as one. I no longer let the motor die at crossroads. After we made it across the plank bridge over Salt Creek, Ray reached down and turned the radio to WGN. Out of the static, somewhere there's a phone. I think I'm sitting on it. Anyway. Out of the static came the, street, came the sweet strains of cocktail hour music from the Empire Room of the Palmer House Hotel in Chicago, Illinois. It was a modern miracle. Here we were, skimming along a country road out past Cowgill's Dairy Farm, and we were hearing music being played in the Chicago Loop. Grandma's head appeared between Ray's and mine. What in the Sam Hill is that noise? she said. Ray indicated the radio. Well, shut it off, she said. Let's listen to the country. So we did. Since a terraplane is another thing with wings, I edged up to 25 miles an hour, watching the needle rise. Over the purr of the motor, we heard a wind pump squeaking as it turned, and a calf bawling, and the katydids starting up in a grove of walnut trees. I see, the, I see us yet, chasing the setting sun down the ribbon of road between the bean rows, in the terraplane. I thought it was about as fine a car as they'd ever make. I'm not so sure it wasn't. Grandma came to the depot with us on the day we were going home, but she wasn't there to see us off. She was there to meet Mrs. Effie Wilcox, who was coming home to her house. The Wabash Bluebird didn't exactly stop at Grandma's town. It only hesitated. As we were struggling to climb on, Mrs. Wilcox was struggling to get off. Her valise was full to bursting, and her eyes were everywhere so I don't know if she spotted Grandma at first. But then, somehow, Mary Alice and I and our suitcase were on board, and Mrs. Wilcox was on the platform, and the bluebird was pulling out. Grandma didn't wave. Mrs. Wilcox was telling her something. But we waved anyway. 